interesting. I never have. I haven't in years and years and years. My daughter bought one. Wow. Um, I got my daughter one for Christmas, actually, because she really wanted, she plays games on it. But we don't really, if I want to see something, you know, I'll, I'll find it on YouTube or something. But, right. um, yeah, otherwise, I can't, I, I just, who's got the time? Jeez, Louise. <laughs> I fall down the right. rabbit hole. Yeah, it's totally crazy. I fall down the rabbit hole all the time with my, uh, just with, let's see, I'm going to open this one because I know Allie's probably not going to be here, but that she's got the same thing going on. This was just so nice. I just have to show off this student because she's here and I'm going to embarrass her deeply. Rena, um, this was her PowerPoint presentation, which looks awesome. Nice formatting, made me laugh. So she gets her extra credit for making me laugh because it's always the case. I'm looking for the individual picture. I know that you posted it. Where did it go? Oh, I forgot where I saved it. I hate that when that happens. Well, I can just pull it from the PowerPoint. No, no, I'll go. No, what am I going to do? I think. And I'm even recording this so everybody can see what a ditz I am, but that's okay. They want us to um, record our sessions, see who shows, you know, what kind of sessions we actually have. I'm the real deal. I am, I am like not reading from a script. I never have, never will. <laughs> um, Raina, where did you post that darn thing? Yeah, that's Allie's work. Um, I wanted to pull up your final drawing. You posted it in a weird place. And I don't remember where. Did you post it in week five separately? Everybody's supposed to do that, but nobody ever does. Oh, I can't find it. Oh, 4-2. 4-2. Okay. Let me look at 4-2. This classroom makes me dizzy. I did save it. I just don't know where I saved it to. That happens if I'm in a hurry. All right, here we go. Yes, yes, yes. I know it's here. Wow, yes, that looks great. Oh, it's a PDF anyway. Okay, that's fine. So what I wanted to show you is put it in the right place at the right time so that I can access it properly. Yes, I know I should always have this stuff done in advance, but I want to play with Photoshop with it a little bit. So this was the final drawing. Meantime, I'll show you the PowerPoint. That looks really good. So this was her, she liked this uh, drawing <clears throat> and this concept. You don't have to, with this project, you don't have to take the concept whole hog from a photograph. You can actually combine two different different disparate, uh, disparate resources as long as you can get the eye level and the lighting and, the, and all that stuff the same. So, so that was her first drawing, concept uh, drawing. Piglet is a real winner. Thank you for uh, also giving credit where credit's due. This was an, another version of the conceptual drawing. Still struggling a bit with perspective on that. Um, here, the bones, it's getting a little bit better. Muscles getting a better. I would like to see, actually, if you want to go in and rework those muscles to be a little bit more muscly, that would be awesome. Then the final. And the difference between, I just have to say, the difference between the final and the concept is so astonishing that I'm going to cry. It made me very happy. So, and then our re requisite, our, our required gestures. Now, with your figure gestures, I do want to say, and I said this in your review, it made me cry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you draw the animals so nice. You have no problem drawing animals. And my suspicion is that you just freeze up when faced with a human being and just fall apart and revert back to being 10 years old. 
so, because that's how the drawings often look when we stop drawing, is like when we were 10. But your figure, your animals are great. So I want you to stop looking at the human figure as people and start looking at them as animals, because that's really what they are. They're just animals. We're, we're all just animals. All right, so with this guy here, I'm going to um, put this into Photoshop so that I can show you. Both of these pictures have the same uh, issue. It's not a bad thing. It's just a minor thing, but it can make a huge difference in your final renderings. You'll be wondering why. Well, they don't teach this kind of stuff in school anymore. That's all I know. I learned it in, um, um, oh, my goodness, that's a huge picture. I learned it in art history, really. We don't get a lot of art history anymore in school these days. The kids these days, you know. So one of the things to check for, and both of these drawings have it to some degree, is the foreground, background um, separation, the separation of the foreground and the background. So there's many, many ways to see and understand depth. And not just binocular vision, although that's the number one way most of us see depth. If we don't have great eyesight, we don't always see that. And with cameras, it's kind of been a, it's, it's a, led us astray in many ways with cameras because you see it, you think it's real, you accept it for what it is, but you can change the, um, I got to turn off. Sorry, I will turn off my announcements here. Um, stop it. Go away. <laughs> um, we see it, we think it's real because it looks pretty much exactly like in many details, but it's not what we're not really seeing it. So that's why it's hard to draw because the camera just takes an impression of the reflection of the light. And we can take that as. I'm talking with my hands, which is doing me no good because you can't see me, but okay. So what bring what makes depth? We have binocular vision, we have perspective, foreshortening, overlap, um, acuity or focus, uh, hue, value and saturation, and scale, a relative scale. So since we're all humans, we measure everything in in relationship to ourselves. So we already know by because of the size mountains are and the size that we are, that there's a human there and there's a mountain there. That mountain must be big and far away. So we obviously, obviously that's in the background. So we accept that. And we've done a little, you've done some of the right things here, but I remember that your reference photo had kind of, I think they kind of um, lightened that area up quite a bit. The reference photo has its own issues because it looks processed. Not that that's a bad thing. It just is something to be aware of. And I really try to, to encourage people to go for the um, making up, taking their own reference, either working from life. That's the number one best thing you can do. And if you can't work from life, then taking your own reference because then you have complete control over the the mountains, the environment, um, everything that, that you want. I'm looking for the, where are you? I just want to bring up the original reference image. It's not showing up in here. Anyway, you would, uh, it just had, just take my word for it. It had a lot of, right here especially, it had a lot of, um, blurring and lighting and I think the colors were enhanced and all that stuff. So if you squint at this drawing, it kind of flattens out a little bit. And one of the reasons is this area of the mountain is so dark. It's actually darker than anything else in the foreground, except for maybe the eye, the stripe and the hooves of this deer. So that mountain just comes right forward and hits you in the face. So one of the things that you can do is, I'm going to try to do this in Photoshop without totally messing things up, is to 
I'm going to put a 50%. No, I'm not. I'm not going to do that either. Hang on. Let me change this. I'm going to break my machine is what's going to happen, and it's going to blow up, and I'm going to have to reboot. I'm going to put a... Not a brightness contrast, not value sat hue saturation. Yes, brightness, brightness contrast on there. So let's drop that background down, lower the bright, low, uh, increase the brightness, lower the contrast, increase the brightness a little more, lower the contrast, and I might try a different one. Let's try levels. Levels is a nicer one. I have more control. So we add a levels to it. What's nice about adding adjustment layers is you can do this to your drawing without killing it, without it changing the, yeah, that's better. Okay, so I'm lightening up that background, reducing the amount of dark pixels in there. Now, the magic trick is you can, draw this as a mask. So I'm going to do a little uh, little Photoshop magic here. And if I take the electric, electric magnetic lasso, it's pretty good about going close to the, it, it finds the, lo the most, um, sorry, can't do this and talk at the same time. The largest amount of contrast between the foreground and the background. So if you use this method and you want to take a look at your quick mask, you can see what's masked out. And mask is this interesting thing because it used to be, I used to work in printing when I first started, when I first, when I was in high school, I got a job at a print shop. And we used to use this stuff called Rubylith and it was red plastic on transparent plastic. And we put it on top of photographs and you use it to uh, mask out the things that you don't that you want to don't want in the photograph or that you want to change in some way. So this exactly is just what we would do in the print shop whenever we were manipulating a photo or just getting a photo ready to print. We would use Ruby List. All right. Then I can put some back in places that I missed it a little bit. All right. So that's essentially that's just a really down and dirty quick way of selecting something. And then I, I hit the letter Q again, and it goes back to my selection. So this is going to be my mask. And I'm going to subtract the background. But I actually am going to reverse it now, the mask, because I want the front to be not affected and the background to be, only be affected. So I've lightened up the background, particularly in this area, and left the foreground in its normal state of um, contrast. And we could even push that contrast a little further just to bring it more forward. So the more contrast that you have in the foreground as well as the overlap. Now, when, one of the things that you fixed that you did a great job in fixing was that initial um, skewed foreshortening. So we fixed that. We talked a lot about that. We met a couple of times on that one. And then the um, overlapping, so you're getting that some of that too. Now you've got a hard outline around the whole creature and around the girl, which is going to take away the depth. Whenever you put an outline around anything, it flattens it out. So it cuts it out of the background, and we don't really want to cut it out of the background. So I would, if you want to turn this into a portfolio piece or perhaps something that you could uh, submit to, for instance, the Honor Society, which I'm part of, you might want to work down work out those edges so that they're not edges anymore. I'm doing this with Photoshop and smudging. It's not ideal. It's not like a pencil. I would do this with a pencil. But you could work those textures out a little more so that we get pretty much eliminate the hard edge. Maybe pull out some of the shadows here. Um, the shadows under the, under the deer would be nice, even if it isn't in the photograph. If you want once you get past using the photograph, crap, that's not what I want to do. Once you get your image going and you're actually creating and you're moving past the reference material, you can do anything you want. So I would probably put more of a shadow 
under the deer here, especially since there's such a nice shadow here, that's going to give it a little more realism. Uh, you've got some shadow here too, but where's the light coming from? I think that we determined the light was coming from this direction. And if that's the case, then go in and add a little extra, little extra shadow to the shadow side. And we can even add a little extra shadow in here and this leg in here. I can't remember what your reference looked like, so but the back leg is usually more in shadow than the foreleg, so that adds a little more depth and mm, oomph to the to the um, the scene. And I think I would even still want I still want to lighten this up. I can't see my tools. Yes, we want the dodge tool, not the burn tool. So I'm still going to lighten up this one dark, dark background. If you look at um, real mountains in the real distance, you're going to see that they actually turn blue as they, as they move into the distance. So we're not dealing with color, we're just dealing with value. So that should drop it back even further. And then getting into the front here, foreground, and getting rid of those outlines, working up the edges, even softening the edges. That will make your figure more realistic. You want to eliminate line wherever possible. I'm not going to be able to do it to the whole thing, but hopefully you can get what I'm, what I'm getting at. Sometimes it's just a matter of working the text, the, shadow, the uh, line, the pencil line down into the body so that there's a smooth transition from the edge to the body. And you see how that makes it start to separate from the background in a good way. It comes forward. It doesn't like it cut out and flattened out like a paper doll. It actually starts to feel like the depth is maybe moving Forwards. I don't remember what this shadow looks like, but this should be, if it's a cast shadow or a form shadow, it would be soft. So shadows on forms as they turn are usually softer. I'll block, drop this down here. And cast shadows, like the shadow that would be cast on the ground from the deer, would be stronger. So if it's a cast shadow, it's hard. If it's a form shadow, it's soft. And if it's an edge, you want to adjust it so that it blends more. I hate doing this with Photoshop, but I think you maybe get my idea. Get what I got? Yeah, okay, good. Good. So this would be a cast shadow, maybe, maybe here. But then this would be, oh, also Photoshop. I mean, my tablet doesn't like working when I'm recording or when I'm broadcasting. So it slows down, which makes me crazy. But I would definitely, even if it didn't have it in the photograph, because you don't know if the photograph's been, how much it's manipulated, adding a little bit of the cast shadow, core shadow treatment to a, a rounded form is going to make it more realistic. So it's, a, it's just a good thing to, to push it past what might normally be already available to you. And then with that eyeball, you just do the do the, my favorite trick with eyeballs. I love doing this. Is you want to get right down into the into the that's a shiny wet object. Let's put a little highlight on it. And on the white, yes I am. A little, shine, a little highlight, maybe a little highlight on the nose too. If the light's coming from this direction, like we said. Okay, so. See how he stands out from the background now, now? Even with that, just that little goofing around with it a little bit. Um, just trying to bring it forward more, separate from the background. Always drop away what's in the distance and let the foreground be um, in the highest contrast, most focus, the most intense colors if you're using color. And usually it's, it's just a matter of dropping back the background rather than increasing the foreground. So now when you squint at it, it looks like the deer and the person are in front. Take away that background thing there and it flattens out again. Not as much because I did a little work around the edges there, but 
it still flattens out. So you can see that this is going to be the same sort of thing. The values of the hill behind the girl are almost identical to the values on her pants. So you really can't see the difference between the foreground and the background. And because there's not a lot of difference, it's going to be harder to grab her form because, it, like I said, it goes for the areas of the highest contrast. Here it's no problem. It just sticks to it. This magnetic wand, magnetic lasso is pretty fun that way. But here it's not going to know where the ears are. But this is just a quick down and dirty grab so that we can do a little ah that's good enough I'll use my quick mask you see so take as much as, as you can to just grab it to make it a little easier and then you can go in and, and do your ruby list this is simply an alpha channel if you never used it before you can see quick mask is just an alpha channel so by and it's a hot key, the letter Q, or you can access it from down here on the bottom of the palette. I was thinking of running some Photoshop, just like, oh, let's get crazy with Photoshop hacks, workshops, just to do, just because of all the things that I learned how to do with it were almost always by accident. I didn't really learn how to use Photoshop. And I've been using it for so long that I've grown up with it so that every time they changed it, it didn't totally destroy my life because it, it changed. they changed the programs every single time they run, do a renovation or re revision. All right, let's get his ears. So there's a couple of other, oh, let's get rid of this here. Come on, my keyboard hates me. I just switch back and forth between the front and the back um, color because in the mask, in an alpha channel, you only have black and white. That's all you have. So it's easy to not even, you don't have to go look at anything. You just go back, X, use the letter X and you can flip back and forth between the foreground and the background. And that way you can get your mask cleaned up in no time at all. All right, so that's, let's give a little more there. More of the fingers. So now I can hit the Q. And at this point, you can actually save this out as a mask in case you wanted to use it later. So just to show you, you just go, um, just select saved selection and save it as an alpha channel. And now it will permanently be in there in the alpha channel if I wanted, ever want to go back to it again. But for now, I'm going to use this as a mask. As a, I'm going to build this in to the levels mask. Do the levels mask again. And I always forget which way is up and down, but you can reverse it easily enough just re by s reversing the selection because it's only between black and white. So I want to actually want to increase the contrast on the figure rather than lighten. I'm that's what I'm going to try to do rather than lighten the contrast on the background. I want to increase the contrast to the foreground. Look at that. Look at it come out of that. Look at it just emerge from the background. It's so cool when you can do that. It just She's just got to work the values a bit more and bring that away from the background. That's the start at any rate. I would still go back in here. There's a couple of things that I would definitely do is I would... Um, Forget about that foot because it's in the snow behind her. She's got a really low eye level on this. So the horizon line is high. We're looking up. We should see just the, um, so we can do it, X, Mad brush. Come on, keyboard, be nice to me, please. Can you do, please? My Wacom tablet disables my keyboard all the time. It's really annoying. So I'll put this on as a layer so that non-destructive editing don't need a group. I need a layer. It is a very good thing to learn. So the foot is going to come if I can get it to paint. What's wrong? Something's not right. 
Turn that off. Got the brush. We have a brush. Let me try another brush. Try that. We're just not getting the brush. Of course not, because it hates me. Try this one more time. Sometimes you just have to slap it over the head. There we go. Oh, I forgot what I was going to do. Oh, right, the foot. So the foot, we actually want to see almost like see the bottom of the foot here and with the snowbank, which is great. But let's go ahead and cover up that boot. Even though we wanted to, couldn't do that because we needed the anatomy, I'd say go ahead and, and partly cover that up. That's going to make this look a little bit more um, like we're not dealing with this weird foot that's hidden behind but is showing off uh, stuff it shouldn't show off. Anyway. We can erase that. We could erase it if we knew what we were doing. The other thing is I would push on. The, she's done a pretty good job of eliminating most of the outlines, so that's not too bad. Um, the hand looks a little funny. I think that it should probably be behind the dog or on the back of the dog. But I don't see any other things that really need to be changed. I think this looks pretty good. Um, you can always push the contrast with a little burn and dodge in certain places just to give it a little more oomph. I'm just I'm I'm really a chiaroscuro and not I love things to be high contrast. And the stuff that comes closest to you should be the highest contrast of all. The sharper the the difference between the the light and the dark and the close items the more, um, see, I would drop, maybe drop the dog back a little bit just so that she stands and, she, and looks clearly like she's in front. I think it's a she. I don't know if it's a she. It might be a he. Looks like a she to me. But that enhances it a little bit, brings it forward. I mean, the difference between that and this is striking, right? So I wanted to show that atmospheric perspective, dropping that background away so that you can have a good separation of foreground and background. Okay, that's all I have to say about that. And now, who's here? How many people have we got? We got a few people. We're going to do some our do our requisite warm-ups because I haven't done my requisite warm-ups. I'm going to stop the recording now.